Well, as I mentioned, church, this is the third Sunday of Advent, and I don't know about you, but it's going by too quick. But like I said, it's because we get busy, we get distracted, and we get just so wrapped up in the, the stuff we have to do for Christmas. And, and doesn't the parties, I mean, when they line up Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, doesn't that get a little stressful? Yeah? Especially coming right after the Thanksgiving season where you have the potlucks and you're cooking meals and you're doing all these things in preparation, right? And maybe you're even helping other people with meals. But that keeps us from really truly understanding why we're in this season. My wife mentioned that this morning. It's just like we're already in third Sunday of Advent. We have one more Sunday of Advent and then we have Christmas Eve. And then before you know it, New Year's here. And then I'm getting ready for Easter, if I can be honest with you. But my goodness, I just, where does time go? It's like we need 48 hours in a day. I mean, COVID was two years. Why can't we have 48 hours in a day now? I'm, I'm going to write to the government and see if we can, get, I need a, what do you call that? A, not a ballot, but a petition. Yeah, I'm going to petition for there to be 48 hours in one day. Especially on weekends when you're preparing for church. I just don't know where time has gone. Um, I know we have families going through a, a difficult time right now in our church. It's just, if it, like I mentioned in prayer, if it can go wrong, it has gone wrong. And if it can break, it's broken. But church, we have to recognize that hope, peace, joy, or love this morning that we're celebrating we have hope in our Savior. We have hope in our Father in heaven who can bring restoration, who can bring healing. We trust in that. Those battling COVID right now in the hospitals, we're praying for them. And it's a significant time to be separated from family. I had the opportunity to visit with uh, Pastor Tracy's parents who are in the hospital here with COVID. And their husband and wife in different rooms down the hall, and the only time they can talk to each other is when husband is feeling strong enough to talk to her on the phone. You're several feet away. Some of our spouses in here might want that for a time or two. <laughs> Social distance from spouses at home. But to go in their rooms and to not have human contact outside of their nurses or doctors, right, people caring for them, especially at this time of the year, right? I, I just can't imagine how hard that is. But just know that your prayers are bringing encouragement. Reach out to them when you can. Facebook them if you can. Send words through Pastor Tracy. Flood them with encouragement because right now they need it more than ever. But this morning we're talking about a love divine. A love divine. I'm, turn into your Bibles. Don't, don't, uh, we're not going to read it yet to Luke chapter 2 again. But I want to ask you, what does Christmas mean? I mean, we say all the right things in church. We say all the right things in Sunday school. We say the right things when we're talking to kids and little children, maybe even our own family members. But what does Christmas mean to a mother who has lost her husband? What does Christmas mean to, to any man that has lost his wife and, and now he's the single parent, just like in the other scenario? Single parents right now have a lot of responsibility but what does Christmas mean to them? You know what it typically means? It means that we have to work overtime to make sure our kids have presents to wrap or unwrap under the Christmas tree. See, Christmas is this season that we're in. It's not about that. But we make it about that. We stress about, I can't get gifts. We can't buy gifts. We, can't, we can only get one gift. We stress about that, right? That means Christmas doesn't mean the right thing to us. We've, we've kind of warped it or Americanized it, right? I mean, it's not just Americans that feel this way. I know that. But we have warped the mindset of what Christmas truly means. What does Christmas mean to missionaries who are halfway around the world away from their families? Those who are serving in armed forces, deployed overseas, fighting the war for us. What does Christmas mean to them? I've never been deployed around Christmas time. I've never been anywhere other than with my family for Christmas time. But I can't imagine being that many miles away from home and only being, now I'm thankful that we have technology when it works. 
We can see through the virtual screens, our family, our, our loved ones at Christmas time. For businesses right now, Christmas means everything to store owners, for business owners, because this is their best time of year. They can get back in the black, hopefully, right? I went to uh, the Sykes Mall last night, and I don't know what's going to happen with that mall. It's just so empty. But stores were closed at like 8.15. I'm like, I thought they would want to be open right now. But there's nobody in the mall. Amazon is loving Christmas time, online delivery and online shopping. But Christmas means different things to different people. Christmas can also mean that it's a painful month to remember all the loved ones, all the friends and family members that we've lost. Christmas has significant meaning for the body of Christ. We're not to give up on that meaning. We're not to lose sight of it. See, the world that we go into right now, full of the lost, full of the broken, full of those that don't have the message of hope, peace, love, and joy that we have, they don't understand. They've heard the stories as kids about Jesus being born. There was a baby born in a manger. There was no room in the inn. We've heard the nativity story. We've seen Christmas movies that, that give us that, that imagery that we can celebrate this. But to some of us, to a lot of us, to most of us, not maybe in this building here, but in the world. It's more about the stresses of Christmas parties and presents and bonuses and all those things. And children, what does Christmas mean to children? Christmas can't get here soon enough. It takes forever for Christmas to arrive. They have to walk by the tree and see the presents under the tree and just wait impatiently, right? Right? I don't, we didn't get to celebrate a whole lot of Christmases as a kid growing up, but I do remember the times when we did have presents, I could not wait. There might have been a time or two where I snuck a peek here and there. I'm sure no one else in here has ever done that before, so I'm okay with, with owning up to that myself. But for children, it's a time of impatience. And I, I forget which song it is, but it's a classic Christmas song you hear throughout the year where mom and dad can't wait for school to start again, right? We're, we're impatiently waiting for school to get back up and going. Because two weeks at home with your kids sometimes can be brutal, especially when they're supposed to behave this time of year. Otherwise, Santa won't come, right? Or they won't get those gifts. Wow. I want to tell you about being so busy in the stressful time of Christmas. There was a family. I read this story several years ago. There was a family who decided to throw a party to honor a very special person who had achieved a great accomplishment. They sent out invitations. They got the decorations ready. They had the hall ready. They had the meal catered. Everything was set up. Everybody showed up on time, and the person of honor never showed they didn't invite him. It was a surprise event. All of this planning, all of this setting everything up, they forgot to invite the person of honor. You see where I'm going this morning? If we get wrapped up in everything that the world says Christmas is all about, we're forgetting to invite the main person to the party. See, we just get so busy. And Lord, forgive us. It's not... It's not always done intentionally, but it just seems to be, we get wrapped up in all those things. Turn into your Bibles to Luke chapter 8, or, or sorry, chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. I want to invite you to stand as we read the Word of God together. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. We read this passage a little bit last week as well. It says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and singing. 
Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those whom his favor rests. Father, we thank you for your word again. And I, I just pray that we recognize you sent your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us because of your divine love. So we thank you for that love. And I pray that this morning that the Holy Spirit is just filtering through us. That we understand the shakings that we're going through right now, all the chaos, all of the stuff in the world around us. Father, you're using us as your vessels to shine this love out to others. So Father, help us. Let us be in tune to your living word this morning, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please, Lord, don't let us be like this family that planned this major party to celebrate a major accomplishment and not invite the person of honor. Let us not get too busy in hectic church to where we forget that Jesus is the reason. This is a love divine that God has expressed to those that he has created for the whole world. Heaven was on tiptoe. Angels were just eagerly awaiting the announcement because they were ready to celebrate. Going back to even the Hebrew people, praying all of their lives for the Messiah, right, in the Old Testament. All of their lives, this is what they were been praying for. Now all of our lives should be focused on the prayer of our second advent of our Savior. Because just like the Hebrew in biblical days, they were praying for their Messiah to come into the earth. Well, he came, and they got to walk with him. They got to learn from him. They call him disciples and apostles. They got to study from the great teacher. They witnessed miracles. They performed miracles because of the power and authority that he gave them, he empowered them with. When he died on the cross for our sins, that was the greatest love story ever written, ever recorded. No matter what poem or what poetry you've ever or, or read as a child or as a teen, no matter what love story is your favorite, this is the greatest love story ever recorded. Last night we had the opportunity for a few of our men's ministry group, we went to go bowling. And I'm hobbled on one knee and, you know, Joseph showed up limping like this when he came in and just his back was stiff. I'm like, this is going to be interesting because neither one of us combined can probably get down the lane and throw a ball. Oh, Michael Pierce was, he was the first one. I said, hey, the one that has the coolest beard and the coolest, the, that looks the best gets to go first. The ugly one gets to go last. <laughs> we won't say who went last. But Michael threw that ball down the lane. I'm like, man, that was like a poet, poem. It just looked beautiful just effortlessly glide. I don't think he hit anything, but he just, it just looks so good. Like, man, I wish I could bowl like that. I told him, I said, that was beautiful. It looked like a poem. Just, just graceful. Might have been a gutter ball. Correct me if I'm wrong later, Michael, but it, it did look pretty. It did look pretty. But this is the greatest love story ever recorded. I'm not a big fan of poems or poetry. I, I had to do it in high school because there were assignments. I don't know if they're still doing that now. But I remember reading poems in, in, in class and doing all the preparation for our finals and in our English classes and stuff like that. And, and the girls would be on their edge of their seats just listening to these poems intentionally like, oh man, that was so beautiful. I'm thinking, that was cheesy. <laughs> you know, that was, that's beautiful. But as I've matured and grown in my faith, I recognize this is the best love story ever told. See, heaven was waiting for the baby that was going to be born, the savior of the world. His name would be Jesus. His name translated to Emmanuel, God is with us. The fact that God made the announcements to shepherds says something. He's telling the lowliest of, lowliest of people, right? Shepherds. If you look at John 3, 16, which uh, Keith shared this morning, it says, God so loved the world that he gave his only one, one and only son, right? We know that. 
That's the purpose. But why did he choose to announce his birth to shepherds? They're on the opposite ends of the social strata from King Herod. He didn't go to kings. He didn't go to rulers and leaders and government officials. He went to shepherds to say, hey, I've got something great for you. You need to come and experience this, right? Shepherds didn't have respect, probably not even from their sheep. They recognized their shepherd's voice, yes, but have you ever tried to wrangle cats up together? That's what I imagine shepherding sheep like. You can't wrangle cats. You can't herd cats. Cats will do whatever they want to do, whenever they want to do it, to whoever they want to do it to. Cats have no respect, right? I, I'm sorry, it says sheep. Let me go back to sheep. Because once I get on that cat thing, I won't stop. <laughs> Shepherds had no power or prestige. But God chose them to announce the news that the Savior of the world is going to be born. Maybe you're sitting in this room right now thinking to yourself, I have no, I have no clout. I have no purpose. To God. Why would God want to use me? Why would God want to communicate with me? Well, because he loves you. Because he can do great things through you, just like he does with the normal people throughout Scripture, which we're going to get into in a minute. God's angels said to them, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, Christ the Lord. One simple announcement reveals the dimensions of God's love for the entire world. It tells us that no matter how insignificant you may think you are, God knows that you are important. God qualifies the called. Does he always call the qualified? Look throughout Old Testament and New Testament and you will see he doesn't always call the qualified, but he will qualify the called. I love that. And my qualifications to be a pastor of a church they were, they were nil. They were, they were non-existent, still building up to this day. But God says, no, I see something in you. He sees something in you. We are all ministers. You may not have that title behind your, your job uh, business card or, or whatever website that you're a part of, but you are a minister. You have a calling on your life. You have a purpose. Every single one of us. That's why I do firmly believe that this is a training grounds for that ministry. This church in specific is a training ground. It's where we're going to get our, our feet dirty. We're going to get our hands dirty. We're going to get dust and dirt all over us because we're busy and we're actively moving in the kingdom. This is not a place where it's going to be you know, look, looked at when we come in and just, oh, this is a magnificent structure. This, I, this is reverent ground. I mean, this is holy ground, yes, but this is only where their training happens. Everything that we learn here in these walls, we are to take out into the mission field. So that on a Tuesday night at prayer, when you see someone scrounging around for food in a dumpster, you go out and help them. It's one thing to say, Lord, I'm going to pray for that man over there who's clearly hungry, who's clearly cold, because if we're cold, he's not even wearing a jacket. The training that we receive here is because God has called us for a purpose. He believes in us. He is equipping us and empowering us to do, even if we think we're insignificant. God showed up to the, his, sent, sent his angels to show up to the shepherds to announce this. Why can't he use us? Amen. Why wouldn't he want to use us? I'm not more significant than a shepherd. I mean, I am a shepherd. I'm a shepherd of this flock. Yes. But see, you are shepherds in your own circles, of your own families, of your own co-workers, of your own classmates, of your own teammates. God has a purpose because he is calling you and he's chosen you for such a time as this. 
Growing up, I never wondered what it's going to be like to live life in a pandemic. I never thought I would see the things that I've seen in my, the last half of my, my life so far. The first 20 years, they went by in a blink of an eye. I thought that everything was going to be great and grand and glorious. I was going to live a life. I was going to be a professional sports player or basketball or football, or maybe I could have been a two-star you know, player or whatever, but God had other plans, right? He gave me the knees and ankles of somebody much older than me. But see, my plans for my life were way different than what God had in store. I knew what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a SWAT officer. Didn't matter what city. I watched a movie and I saw all the tactical gear that they were wearing. And I saw the, the, the stuff that they were doing to save people. I'm like, yes, that's what I want to do. I want to be that guy. It was Keanu Reeves, by the way. I want to be that guy. That's what I want to do with my life. I want to be, I want to be a guy in uniform and I want to save people. I never knew I wanted, I, I, I joined the military late, right? I was a late bloomer in the military. But, man, I just, I knew what I wanted to do. And God said, that's great. That's, I'm, hey, you have your plans, but just so you know, I've got my plans too. And kids say, our daughters are going to tell us something. This is what I want to do. This is what, hey, that's great, but this is what you're really going to do. They may not like it always, but it's because we know what's best for them. We know that we, we do it out of love. God is telling us he chose us for such a time as this because he loves us. He believes in us. See, we have a responsibility to take this message and bring revival into the world around us. He chose us to do that because he loves us. He wouldn't choose you if he didn't love you. His divine love said that he sent his one and only son to be born to be our Messiah. That's his love. All through scripture, we see God honoring and using people that the things of the world overlook or ignore because of his divine love. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 26 through 31. It says, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Story about Joseph, Jewish young boy sold into slavery by his brothers, carted off to Egypt. When God wanted to deliver a specific message to the mighty Pharaoh, who did he use? Joseph. What was Joseph? What did he do? Right? They, they had land and farms and they did all this kind of work, right? Nobody. He was a nobody in his family, according to his brothers. Now, his father, maybe not so much. But Joseph became a slave, was brought into the dungeons to interpret messages from Pharaoh. He was a young slave that God elevated to the highest position in Egypt's government. Hmm. I don't know if we have any born politicians in here, but I'll be praying for you. I don't know if we have any noble births in here, any royalty in here outside of the kingdom of, of Jesus. Are there any royalties? Are you born in the lines of, I don't know, Prince of Ukraine? Is that even a title? The, the point is, is God doesn't see all that. He doesn't say you have to have this checklist to be used by me. What he wants is your willingness. What he wants is your heart to believe. What about Mary? When God decided to select the mother of his son, Jesus, who did he choose? A young girl. 
a young woman named Mary. I wonder what it would be like if we lived in those days and you knew Mary, you were close to Mary. Maybe you were her friend, maybe you're a relative, and she came to you and said, an angel of the Lord said that I'm to be Jesus' mother, the mother of his son. Hamana, hamana, hamana. I mean, what would that feel like to hear those words? What if you were Mary? God uses those that other people deem insignificant, that don't matter. He chooses them for a reason. And where did God, where did Jesus come from? Where, where was his hometown, Nazareth? Nothing ever happened in Nazareth. I, I love watching The Chosen when they talk about the city of Nazareth. Nothing ever happens. Nothing good comes from Nazareth. Yes, there is. There's something great that came from Nazareth. What about the young boy when Jesus fed the 5,000? See, this young boy wasn't a noble birth. He was there amongst the crowd with the 5,000. He had two fish and five loaves of bread. Jesus took that little boy's lunch that his mom probably packed for him because he knew he'd be hungry. First of all, the little boy wanted to learn from Jesus. I love that because that's something I think we take out of context or take away from we realized this little boy wanted to be there. Yes. Maybe mom said, no, you're going to Sunday school and the teachers are going to be there and you're going to listen and you're going to sit down and be still and here's your lunch. Take all that. He could have. He could have been that way, but he still went. I love that message. But here God, Jesus used this little boy who is probably insignificant to anybody else in the crowd. But no, God says, no, I want to use you. You have your food, and it's going to feed everybody. And then there's going to be a miraculous 12 baskets full afterwards. Jesus, God, knows what he's doing. When Christ came, he wasn't born in Mount Sinai Hospital in Jerusalem. He was born in a stable. He was wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. It's a significant symbolic thing that God doesn't just call the qualified. What were Mary's qualifications to be the mother of the Savior of the world? What were Joseph's qualifications to be held in such a high position in the government in Egypt? What were this little boy's qualifications? I think they had one, to be willing. Are you willing? Are you willing to let the God, the author and the perfecter of our faith to use you? Are you willing to say, yes, Lord, here am I. I too want to be used just like these people. See, this is a message for the whole world, but not the whole world will receive it. There will be plenty of people who will turn this, this story, this message and reject it. You see that right now. Just look outside your doors. Look on the news. Look on social media. So many people reject this message. But so many accept the message of Christmas, right? Very few people throughout the world that don't celebrate Christmas in, in comparison. But this is a message for all families that need to hear Families who are struggling with identity, individuals who are struggling with identity and purpose need to hear this message that God chooses those, even though we may seem like we're insignificant, that we don't matter, God says otherwise. Mothers trying to raise children without father need to hear this message. God has chosen you. Don't give up. Husbands who have lost their wives in death need to hear that. You're not alone. Spouses who have lost spouses who are widows, they need to hear this message that God still loves you, that you are still significant in his eyes, and he still wants to use you. Church who feel, people that feel useless and, and empty need to hear this message. God has chosen you for such a time as this. And I'm glad that I am not alone in that choosing. 
Whether my girls see it or not, they were too chosen for such a time as this. And is that a lot of pressure to put on teenage girls? Absolutely, it can be. But see, God doesn't worry about the pressures of the world. He just says, I just want your heart. I just want you to be willing to, for, for me to share this news with you, share this message of my love so you can tell everyone you know how much I love them. But see, in, in the world today, these kids, love is different. Love is being accepted in a text group thread, right? If I'm not in that thread, then I'm not loved. There's body shaming, there's fat shaming, there's this shaming and that shaming, all kinds of things, right? If we don't have the right clothes or if we don't have the right cell phone or we don't have the right vehicle. <laughs> I remember in high school, I, I wasn't afforded a vehicle when I got my driver's license. Um, and I, I wanted to ask this girl out on a date in high school. But I remember somebody else asking her out, and her words were, what kind of car do you have? I'm like, I ride the bus to school. I don't know if she's going to want to go out with me if I ride the bus. So I never asked her out. Because I heard some other guy say, hey, you want to go out on a date? What kind of car do you have? I don't have one. Well, then I can't go out with you. I'm like, wow. Probably still happens today. I don't, I don't know if it does or not. I got around with Tom and Jerry. Anybody know who Tom and Jerry are? Tom, Jerry. <laughs> That's how I rolled. But see, that kind of love is what the world depicts as acceptable. But God's love is something totally different. He loves us even while we were still sinner. He sent his son to die for us. Did you hear that? I know we've read that verse thousands of times, but hear that love again. God loved us so much, loves us so much, that even while we were sinning, he sent his son to die on the cross for us. Does that sit in a little bit deeper? Because it should. That is an ultimate love. All of us have known feelings of emptiness and rejection and despair and loneliness. Most of us have experienced the depressions, the fogs that we call them, most of us experience all these different times in our life where we go through and we just feel like, I can't seem to, to get out of this. Why am I even in this position? What did I, what, what has happened? What circumstances have happened in my life that have put me in this state of mind? Because that's not where God wants us living. He wants us living to where we know and understand and we have our true identity through our Savior. He wants us to live that and abundant. When I met that young man, Jeremy, on Tuesday night, started talking with him, and he's from San Antonio, and gave him a business card. I, none of us were really that prepared. <laughs> um, thankfully, Miss Susan had a blanket, and we, I think we wrangled up some cash for him, and, and uh, we gave him some water, and my wife gave him some cookies, and, you know, all these things, and and uh, I said, let me take you to go get a meal. I'll even eat with you. He's like, no, no, I don't want to lose all my stuff and, you know, leave it here and carry it. And I think he was afraid that it might stink up the car. I, that doesn't bother me. But see, I wanted to share that message. And I got to share a glimpse of that message. And then he asked, what church are you? I, asked, I told him, I said, if you ever, I gave him a business card. If, if you ever are in town or if you need to call me for something, here's my number and just reach out to me and, just, I'm going to make it to your church one day. I'm going to make it to your church one day. Jeremy's going to come to those doors one day. I don't know where Jeremy's salvation is right now. But one day, because of the love that Jesus can demonstrate through others, Jeremy's going to give his life to that love. One day, your family members who are lost, who are broken, who are desperate, for something else that they just can't seem to find and, and get a hold of, they're going to to be won over from that love of our Savior. But guess how they're going to receive it? 
It's not always going to be through your pastor. It's going to be through you. You are the ones that are going to demonstrate, to share, to teach, to show that kind of love. It's going to come in different forms, different waves, different circumstances. But see, Christmas comes and we feel all this stuff. But if we're not careful, we're going to forget to invite the, uh, the person of honor. The reason why we're gathered, we're going to tend to forget. We're going to leave them out again. And next year, we're going to say, last year was too busy. This year, oh, we're, we're going to really sit down. We're really going to focus. Every year, we say the same things, just like New Year's resolutions. This year, in January, I wanted to lose 50 pounds. I did it at different times, like 10 pounds here and 8 pounds there and three pounds there, and I gained it all back. I mean, I, I just, I'd lost a total of 50 pounds this year, easily. But I probably gained, I don't know, we're not going to go there, but <laughs> my goal next year is to lose it and keep it off. I See, I didn't say that this year. I just said, I just want to lose it. <laughs> but we say the same things every year, don't we? I'm getting shape. I told you, I'm in great shapes now. I'm in great shapes. But I want to get better. I want to get, see, New Year's resolutions and Christmas time and all these things. And we say all these things. But if we don't put any action behind them, they're worthless. We're trying to be intentional as a family and doing a study in Luke. It doesn't happen every night. Why? Because of the hustle and bustle of life. If he matters, we're going to make it matter to us. We matter to him. We matter so much that he sent his son to die for us. 1 John 4, 9 says, this is how God showed his love. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. A life of love, a divine life of divine love. 2 John 1, 6 says this, and this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. So there's your purpose. What am I here for, Lord? What am I supposed to do with my life? Walk in his love. Walk in it, own it, strut in that love. <laughs> Whatever it takes, this is how the rest of the world is going to receive it. They're going to see it in us. And the problem with Christians is, or Christianity in general, is they see us do one thing here and do another throughout the rest of the week. That's not a life of love. That's a life of convenient love, whatever's convenient for us. God's not saying, when it's convenient for you, my child, would you please walk in love? No, he's saying, in whatever way, shape, or form of life, this is what I need you to do. Don't worry about when it's not convenient. And let me tell you, there's some church members in this congregation right now. It's not convenient for a lot of folks. They're going through a lot of stuff right now. God still wants them to walk through a life of love. There's still a message. There's still opportunities. I wonder if the shepherds just sat around the campfire many times thinking, what's the purpose of this? What's the point? Who's going to know if we're not watching these sheep? What difference does it make whether or not I get out of the morning or get out of bed in the morning? Have you ever felt that way? You ever thought, what's the point? What's the point of me going to school today? Well, probably every student says that every morning. But what's the point? What's the point of me going into work today? What's the point of me earning a paycheck when all it does is just barely covers the bills? We don't have enough at the end of the month. What's the point of even doing this anymore? It can, it can seem that my, uh, life has its endless cycles of things that just feel like they don't mean anything to us or they, don't, they shouldn't mean anything to anybody else. Who's going to notice if I'm there or not? But to Jesus, it matters most that he gave his life's blood on the cross for us. See, no matter how insignificant any of us think we are, Jesus died that we might live and live life abundantly. So Jesus didn't do all this. God didn't send him to die on the cross for us just for us to live a life that just ekes by. 
And you're probably thinking, well, that's a lot of my life right now. Then you're not walking in the love that's identified in this scripture. We're walking in the circumstances. We're walking in the situations and the trials. See, we're labeling and identifying ourselves with what we go through. But Jesus is saying here through God's word, I want you to live life in love. Is it always easy to love those that are around you? Last week we talked about having that peace, even with the person that calls and your auto warranty is expired and we're calling you again. See, God says love that person too. Live a life of love. I had an opportunity several years ago at the last church I came from. I think I've shared this once before. I was the only pastor on staff that particular time in the morning at the church. I'm not sure where everybody else was. They may have been at a conference or something. But I get to the church, and the first thing I get is a phone call from a lady who lives in an outlining town of Fort Worth, Cleburne. And she says, my son is in prison, and I would like for somebody to go pray with him. And they said, well, do we have a prison ministry here? I'm like, we do now. So I get in my truck and I drive to Cleburne. I make a phone call back to the church just to confirm the name of the person. And then the mother wants to talk to me. So I, I get the phone number and then I call the mother. And, and she says, you know, all this stuff about her son. He's a teenage boy, blah, blah, blah. I said, well, ma'am, if you don't mind me asking, what is he in, in prison for or jail for? He said, well, for rape. I'm like, hold up. I got four girls. I don't want to go pray for this dude anymore. That's my initial. I even called my wife. I said, hey, I need you to pray for me because I'm about ready to turn this truck around. I don't even want to go. She prayed with me, encouraged me. I don't remember what she said, but it worked. I still went. I met with him, prayed with him. He gave his life to Jesus. It was underage Underage teenagers, promiscuous, that's all it was. Parents didn't like it, so they filed a claim, and that's all it takes. They were in love and all these things. But see, if I had walked in the circumstances and said, I am not going to go, because I've already labeled him, I don't, that's not love, that's circumstantial. That, that's just in my own situation, in my own path. I've decided, no, that's not, I'm not going to walk in love for him. Why? Why should I love him? God says walk in love to everybody. To, to God, everybody counts. Even some of the people that have done the worst and most evil and vile things on this earth, God still loves them. He doesn't love me more than anyone here. He loves me just as much as he loves you. Just as much as our neighbors right next door. Just as much as the homeless, just as much as a drug addict, just as much as those trafficking individuals into our city, he loves them all. But see, somewhere along the line, they have lost light of this message of walking in love, or they've never really paid attention, or they have never really heard it. That's where we come in, folks. That's our job. That's our calling for such a time as this. Look at the world around you right now. There's so much division and hatred, and that's just in the White House. But God loves them just as much as he loves us. And... Uh, we are to show them and walk in that love. Some years ago, there was a cartoon in, in a, a newspaper when they used to have the comics. Do they still have comics? I don't know. I don't read the paper on paper form anymore. Long time ago, they had a newspaper comic, and there was a picture of two farmers in a very primitive setting talking across the fence, you know, on their ranches. One farmer asked the other farmer, anything exciting happened today? Nah, nothing exciting. Nothing but a baby born over at Tom Lincoln's house. Well, Tom Lincoln's son was Abraham Lincoln. 
So nothing ever exciting happens, right? You know, that baby Abe Lincoln, born in the house of Tom Lincoln, one day became president of the United States and changed the course of history that liberated slaves. See, one life, one life can make a difference. Jesus made a significant difference for the whole world. Your life can make a significant difference. I've never heard of anything happening exciting here in Wichita Falls except for the Pringles lady that drank wine out of a Pringles can. That, was, that made national news. We were well known. Um, that's typically what towns get known for. Crime, right? Even if it is weird and stuff like that. Or the lady eating half a cake and not wanting to pay for the other half. Remember that? Yeah, that was funny too. Or when an 85-year-old lady beats up a pastor to Sam's, you know, that kind of stuff we're, we're known for, you know. But nothing ever exciting happens in Wichita Falls. When the falls are turned on, that's a good day in Wichita Falls. But see, he can use every single one of our insignificant lives if we think of it that way. And you shouldn't. Because God values you. He can do a great many things with your life today. There's a great many people right in this city right now that need to hear this, this message of love. First advent has come. The second advent is coming because we know that Jesus is coming again. We see that in the greatest love story ever told. So when life seems just too heavy, you're just too burdened, you just feel like, well, Lord, I wish you would come today because I'm tired of dealing with all this stuff. Or come and take us home so we don't have to go through this anymore. See, so when we go through these tough times, these tough seasons, these seasons of shaking, it's because God loves us. He loves us. The love of Jesus compelled him to the cross. Through his shed blood, we now have life and a life to be lived in love and in abundance. So in the celebration of Christmas, we have to see beyond the glamour, beyond the lights, beyond the trees and the decorations, beyond the presence, and focus on the presence of our Savior. Don't forget to invite him <laughs> into your homes, into your life. Don't overlook the fact that we're celebrating a major significant birth. And forget the person of honor, our Savior. I'm going to invite the praise team to come forward this morning as we close. As I mentioned, this is our third Sunday. Next week, we have our joy Advent service and then our Christmas Eve. I don't tell you this because you're running out of time to buy Christmas presents for those that you love. That's not why we're doing any of this. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you this to be cautious. Today, even when you go home, focus as a family on the true meaning. Get back to the beginnings. Go back to the basics. Scrub everything out that you have to. Get rid of the noise in the background and, and all the stresses. Just, just release all that. See, that's not what this is all about. Teach your family. Teach one another. Demonstrate Demonstrate even the love that Jesus is talking about, that God is talking about in his word. If not to one another in your own homes, go out and demonstrate that to somebody else, even to somebody you don't know. Be that life that can affect, bring about change in our cities, in our communities. You're not insignificant. God doesn't always choose the qualified, but if he calls you, he'll qualify you to do the job he's put before you, to live a life of love. You're not insignificant. He loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you. Isn't that something? I stand as we close in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for your love for the whole world that you sent your one and only son to be born of someone of little significance. I'm grateful, Lord, that Mary didn't turn away. 
She didn't run in fear, but that she believed. She accepted her purpose and her calling. And away, Father, she just said, here am I. Use me. And Lord, at times in our lives where we have thought that we were insignificant, that we don't matter, that we have no purpose, we don't even know what our identity is, I pray, Lord, that we cease in thinking that because we know what we're supposed to do. We're to live a life of love, the love demonstrated by our Savior, the Messiah. Lord, I pray that the rest of today, the rest of this year, the rest of our lives, we take heart. I know that December is a hard time. Winter can be a hard time. The new year can be a hard time for many of us. Father, that we don't let that be our identity. That we choose to live a life purposed by you, called by you, qualified by you. I pray, Father, that we can bring an evidence to this love and to the world around us, that we have opportunities to go out into our cities, our neighborhoods and schools and jobs and churches, everywhere that we have, Lord. I pray that we walk so closely with you. People are drawn to us. They say to us, what is it about you? What is it that you have that I'm missing out on? I want that. I pray, Father, that you have this spirit anointing conversation and prompt us, Lord, and the people that we pass by. Store clerks, bank tellers, food delivery, whatever the case may be, Lord, may we share the love of God that has, he has sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us, not to condemn us, but to save us. May that divine love be echoed. Father, we thank you. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship.